For this week's Challenge Wednesday, we have our patient, Alara. And Alara is two weeks post right total knee arthroplasty and has a past medical history of lymph node hypoplasia. The patient presents with 6 out of 10 diffuse right calf pain, and the right calf is 1.5 centimeters greater than the left. Which of the following is the therapist's best course of action? So we got A, apply long stretch bandaging to reduce edema. B, alert the physician immediately for a high risk of DVT. C, record lower extremity pain and size and initiate manual lymphatic drainage. And D is to hold treatment until the patient is cleared for physical therapy. All right, so we got a lot to go through here. Let's break it down piece by piece because there's going to be some hidden secrets that you can use in order to help you dominate questions like this on your MPTE. I'm going to talk to you all about that right now. So Alara is two weeks post right total knee arthroplasty. All right, so that's a total knee replacement, one of the most common types of surgical procedures that's done for the lower extremity. We need to know that for the MPTE. All right, so we got a total knee arthroplasty, pretty straight, uh, pretty straightforward there, and a past medical history of lymph node hypoplasia. So this is where I want to slow down real quick because we got to understand what that really means and uh, how that plays into this clinical presentation. All right, so lymph node hypoplasia. Well, that's a form of primary lymphedema, or at least creates primary lymphedema, right? Lymph node hypoplasia is when typically there's a reduced number of lymph nodes that are developed in the body. It's usually like a congenital problem, all right? So a reduced number of lymph nodes in the body. Now, what's the lymphatic system used for, y'all? Can we can we satisfy that right now? Like, what is the lymph uh, lymphatic system used for primarily? We know that it drains fluids off, right? But it's also a part of the immune system. It helps to fight infection. And in these specific lymph nodes, there are immune cells that help to break down that infection or the bacteria or whatnot. That's the reason why we tend to get a lot of swelling of the lymph nodes when there's an infection, right? So lymph node hypoplasia is not a good thing because we don't have the adequate amount of lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, well, that sets us up for things like lymphedema, right? All right, so that's something that we need to keep in mind. Now this patient has had a surgery. Now it says the patient presents with six out of 10 diffuse right calf pain. Now that's something to keep an eye on, right? Is it typical for a patient who has a total knee arthroplasty to present with knee pain? Yes. How about calf pain. What's the first thing that starts to like click off in your mind? Because when I read that, the first thing that clicks off in my mind is potential DVT. You know, that's one of the safety type of arenas that we need to be aware of, you know, especially on the MPTE is the whole DVT thing. So the patient has six out of 10 diffuse right calf pain. So I'm keeping an eye on that. And it says the right calf is 1.5 centimeters greater than the left. Oh, that's another thing I'm thinking about when it comes to DVT. Are you thinking the same thing? Let me know, baby. All right, so which of the following is the therapist's best course of action now given this information? All right, so let's go through the answer choice again. We got A, apply long stretch bandages to reduce edema. All right, B says alert the physician immediately for a high risk of DVT. C, record lower extremity pain and size and initiate manual lymphatic drainage. And D is whole treatment until the patient is cleared for physical therapy. Now, don't play with me. You need to select an answer. Don't wait for me to give you the answer. You need to select one. Which one is it? A, B, C, or D? All right, so let's break these down one by one. A says apply long stretch bandages to reduce edema. Now, we know that this patient is potentially having some edema going on, right? Potentially, we we see that the patient has the diffuse uh, right calf pain. We see that the patient has swelling because the right calf is 1.5 centimeters greater than the left. All right. The question is, would you apply? Is this your best course of action to apply long stretch bandages? 
Well, already I don't like that answer. You want to know the reason? I don't like it because for patients who have a form of lymphedema or for swelling, you don't really want to apply long stretch bandages. Why? Because they tend to have a low working pressure and a high resting pressure. What does that mean? Well, the working pressure is, is the pressure that the bandage is going to exert on the body or on the limb when the muscles are actually working. And we want a high working pressure. Because we want that bandage to be working with those muscles and helping to pump that fluid up and out of the lower extremity and towards the heart. We want a high working pressure. The long stretch bandage has a low working pressure. So that's one thing I don't like. All right. The other thing that the long stretch bandage has is, is a high resting pressure. And I don't like that. Because a high resting pressure means that when the patient is at rest, the muscles are not pumping, the bandage is putting forth a high level of pressure on the leg. Well, we don't want that because it starts to create like a tourniquet effect, and that could be really damaging to the lymphatic system. This is the reason why I don't like long stretch bandages for patients who have lymphatic problems at all. It's just not good. So... An answer I would have liked if, is if it said apply short stretch bandages to reduce edema. See, that would have been a better answer. But long stretch bandages, absolutely not. That is not going to be my best course of action right now. I'm going to go ahead and put X next to that. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go ahead to B. B says alert the physician immediately for a high risk of DVT. Mm, this is where I need to slow up. This is this hidden secret in some of these questions that I that I was telling you I want you to look out for. It's this thing called a clinical prediction rule. All right, it's this mathematical tool that we can use to help us to diagnose, to help us treat a patient effectively, for us to help uh, give a, an accurate prognosis. So they're mathematical tools. They're called clinical prediction rules. Have you ever heard of the Wells clinical prediction rule? You ever heard of that? Maybe you have. All right. Well, the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule, if you look at it, there's a few things that we look for to see if the patient is at high risk for DVT. And on the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule, if you get a three or higher score, you're at high risk for DVT and we need to do something about it. The question is, is this patient right now at high risk for DVT? Yes or no? That's the question I'm trying to answer. Well, if you look at the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule, you'll see that if a patient has had surgery, a major surgery, within the past 12 weeks, that gets you a point. So that's one. They also say that, well, if the patient has a calf size that's three centimeters or greater than, than the unaffected side, then that's also another point. So let me ask you. Does this patient have a right calf that's three centimeters or greater than the left? You should be saying no to me, baby. You see, uh, Those of you on the podcast right now, you might not have remembered from the question, but remember that the right calf was 1.5 centimeters greater, not three. So that is not a point. Mm -mm. You might be saying, but Kyle, in the question, it did say that the patient has six out of 10 diffuse right calf pain. And isn't that consistent with a DVT? Well, according to the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule, you need to have localized tenderness along the deep venous system. Localized tenderness, not diffuse. So that is not a point on the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule. All right. So right now, we, we really don't have that much evidence to state that this patient's at high risk. But here is the one piece of the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule that really makes B not correct. At the end of the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule, it makes a statement that an alternative diagnosis to DVT is likely or more likely, you're actually going to deduct the score by two points. If you have a diagnosis that is as likely as a DVT or more likely, you deduct two points. 
right now we only had one point. Remember, the patient had a surgery within 12 weeks, major surgery. We only have one point right now. And because, I mean, this patient could be experiencing, I mean, the swelling that we're looking at could be just because the patient uh, has lymph node hypoplasia. They're at risk for edema. So that could be the reason why we're seeing the seeing the increase in size of the right calf. The, the fact that we have 6 out of 10 diffuse right calf pain could just be because of muscle guarding of the gastrocnemius or the soleus. I mean, the patient just had a surgery, right? So those muscles can be tight and irritated and hypertonic. And so that could be the reason why we have the 6 out of 10 pain. So here's the deal. Is there a diagnosis that is just as likely, right? Or even more than likely than having a DVT? The answer to that is yes. And so guess what? According to the Wells clinical prediction rule, I shouldn't alert the physician immediately about a high risk for DVT because... There's not a high risk for DVT. So B would not be our best answer. All right, bird's eye view here. You need to understand what the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule and everything that goes into it. You need to understand that you need to have a three or higher on the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule in order for the patient to have a high risk of DVT. Our patient right now, Alara, does not have a high risk of DVT. And so B cannot be the right answer. Do you all follow me? I mean, that's really important for you to understand. That's one of those hidden secrets right there that you can get hit, tripped up on is the use of clinical prediction rules. Let's look at C. C says record the lower extremity pain and size and initiate manual lymphatic drainage. All right, so let's think about this. Hold on, hold on. Record lower extremity pain and size. Now, would you do that? All right, would you record the lower extremity pain and size and initiate manual lymphatic drainage. Well, I like this answer because, I mean, it is important for us to record the pain and the patient's size and that and, and make sure that we're initiating the manual lymphatic drainage to help with the swelling that's in the leg. I agree with that. I like it a lot. And we definitely want to make sure that we're recording the uh, lower extremity pain and size. Why? Because we want to see, you know, is this improving or not, right? So that's important. So I like it. Doesn't mean it's the best answer, but I like it right now. I'll go ahead and put a check mark next to that. Let's go to D. D says hold treatment until the patient is cleared for physical therapy. Well, here's the question about that one. First of all, should we hold treatment? Is it appropriate for us to hold treatment right now? I mean, the patient's not at high risk for DVT. You wouldn't even consider the patient to be at moderate risk for DVT, looking at the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule. All right. So is should we hold treatment, absolutely do nothing for this patient at all? I would say no. I think that's a little extreme. And then wait until the patient is cleared for physical therapy. I mean, first of all, there's nothing in here telling us that the patient was on hold anyway. And since we're not referring the patient back to the physician for clearance or anything like that, there's no reason for us to be waiting for clearance. And so I don't like D. Our final answer has to be C right now. It is the best. Although I think that there could be a better answer. I think that could, there could be a better or a more perfect answer. There could be, but C is the best answer when we look at our answer choices here. It's the best, all right? So for those of you who got this question correct, congratulations. For those of you who didn't, one of the hidden secrets that you need to be ready for on the actual MPTE is this idea of clinical prediction rules. That oftentimes, you just need to understand what the clinical prediction rules are, and if you do you'll be able to figure out what the diagnosis is or figure out what the best intervention is. Because the question a lot of times is just asking, do you know what the clinical prediction rule and which of the following is missing? Or what is the best strategy or the best approach once you see this clinical prediction rule? What do we do next? All right. And so that's one of the hidden ways, one of the hidden secrets that you can use to do much better on your MPT questions regarding this topic.